I am really excited to introduce our speaker for today's session, um, Justine M. Bernstein. Uh, Justine is a PhD candidate at Rutgers University in Newark in New Jersey, USA, and he's studying the evolutionary biology of snakes. He has had a lifelong passion for reptiles and has been studying herpetology since 2014 when he got his um, MS biology degree from Villanova University. And for the last seven years, he has studied the systematics of lizards and snakes in the Pacific and Southeast Asian regions and has traveled, uh, traveled to a variety of locations in the United States, Central America, South America, and Asia to better understand their ecology, diversity, and evolutionary histories. Um, currently, Justin's focus of research is studying the diversity and evolution of homalopsid snakes or mud snakes in Southeast Asia with a particular focus in the Philippines. And a large part of his work is collecting data from the field and using resources in natural history collections and museums to study the genetics and morphology of populations to discover undescribed diversity, identify new species, understand how snakes have dispersed to regions through time. Friends, that's, that's all welcome. Justin Bernstein. Justin? Hey, so hey. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to the seminar series. I am really looking forward to talking to everyone uh, about my favorite topic, which would be snakes. And so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. So uh, as I said, really start to talk to everybody uh, about snakes, which is by far one of my favorite topics, and more so how we can uh, look at DNA and morphology to learn more about the evolutionary histories of these snakes as well as their biodiversity. So just as a small outline for this talk, I'm going to give a brief introduction kind of about myself, some of the work that I do at Rutgers University, which will be kind of interspersed throughout this talk. I will talk a bit about my research aims and kind of what I'm interested in. I'll talk a bit about systematics, and I know that not everybody here is going to be an expert in systematics, and there might even be some of you who don't even know what systematics is, which is okay. I'll be giving a, uh, a crash course of systematics during this talk as well, and then I'll kind of uh, start talking about stakes, uh, why we study them, about their diversity, uh, the questions that we can answer using snakes as systems, and then I'll kind of transfer this over into my talk about the Philippines as well as Philippine uh, biodiversity. And then this will roll into two case studies, one of which is more on the preliminary end, but this is going to be looking at the systematics and diversity in a group called dog-faced water snakes, and this is going to be using molecular data like DNA. And then the other study is one that we just wrapped up, and this is going to be looking at this uh, endemic lineage of snakes in the Philippines called hemibungaris, and this is using morphological data. So to start off, uh, as mentioned, and as you all know by now, my name's Justin, but I always like to take the opportunity to show some fun uh, photos of me in the field, because I hardly take photos of myself in the field. And these photos are taken from the Philippines, but I'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, so I'm a herpetologist, and this means that I study both, uh, either reptiles and or amphibians, and I particularly specialize in studying lizards and snakes. And I do this in a systematic framework, and I study taxonomy as well. But the overarching goals that uh, are really what my research is based off of is trying to investigate biodiversity and also to investigate and figure out what evolutionary processes and mechanisms have given rise to that biodiversity and can also change that biodiversity. So some of the studies that I've published with my colleagues uh, uh, recently have been looking a bit at island biogeography. So this is looking at past sea level fluctuations and how they have connected and disconnected islands in the past and how we can see that reflected in the genetic structure of hemidactylus geckos and tracheobius skinks uh, off the coast of Africa. One was looking at uh, these cylindrophied snakes. So these are these pipe snakes that are native to Southeast Asia. And we described a new species from Myanmar just last year. And then I've also dabbled a little bit into DNA barcoding and looking at how we can use a single gene of DNA and seeing how we can use that to look at some evolutionary relationships, but more so help us understand the diversity in particular regions and to help identify particular species using genetic material. 
Now, I've mentioned systematics a few times in this talk already, and I'm going to be defining systematics as quantifying and qualifying Earth's biodiversity. I say quantifying because we do use statistical means and computer algorithms in order for us to look at the evolutionary process. But I also say qualify because sometimes we do need to be uh, a bit subjective about this with our own knowledge and expertise and based off of prior research. So this is going to involve two major disciplines. We have taxonomy, which is going to be the hierarchical classification of organisms. And this is going to be classifying them into species, genera, family, and so on and so forth. So many are familiar with this. But then we also have phylogeny, which is going to be looking at the evolutionary relationships of these organisms. And so the reason why we would want to use a systematic framework in order to investigate particular systems uh, is plentiful. We could look at phylogeny estimation. So this would be looking at the raw evolutionary relationships of organisms and lineages. We can look at the evolution of traits. So an example of this are using ancestral state reconstructions. And there was a study done a while ago at geckos where we know there are diurnal and nocturnal geckos. And the question that can be answered is, was the ancestral gecko nocturnal or diurnal? And how many transitions between nocturnality and diurnality were there throughout the evolution of all geckos. We can look at alpha, beta, and gamma taxonomy of different organismal groups. So this is going to be describing new species and also looking at species hierarchy as well as assemblages. And we can look at the biodiversity in entire regions or particular habitats like rainforests or mangroves. And finally, we can also put this towards conservation as many studies have now used evolutionary distinctiveness and relatedness to help prioritize particular populations for conservation. Now, why these are, while these are all really cool ways that we can use systematics in different systems, what I really wanna focus on right now is talking about the estimation of phylogeny. So right here, we have a phylogenetic tree on the left, and we call it that because it resembles that of an actual tree. So sometimes you'll hear me just say tree or phylogeny. And typically we flip these on their side and like a tree, they have a particular anatomy. There's the root, which is the most recent common ancestor of all of our lineages in our tree. There are the nodes, which represent these divergence events of these horizontal lines, which represent lineages. So these are called the branches of our tree. And then we have the tips of our tree, and these aren't really shown here, but there would be these labels, which are our samples. So the samples can be individuals, they can be populations, species, uh, genera or families, it's really whatever our sampling scheme is of our study. And then time runs from the root in the past to the present at the tips, at least for the sake of this presentation. So if we have a hypothetical phylogeny shown on the right with four species, A, B, C, and D, we would say that C and D are each other's closest relatives. So C and D are sister species and that B diverged before C and D, and B is more closely related to C and D than either of them are to A. Now, and that is because they share a recent common ancestor. And A would be our outgroup, which is going to help us kind of look at the relationships of our in-group, which in this case is B, C, and D. Now, how do we make phylogenies? We make phylogenies by uh, using various data types, and typically we use morphology. So this is going to be either the internal or external anatomy or the physical appearance of particular traits and organisms, or we could use molecular data, which would be either DNA or RNA. Some studies use amino acids and protein data, uh, for, but for the sake of this talk, I am going to be talking about DNA. And also sometimes we can incorporate other types of data, such as ecological data or geological data into our trees. So I study reptilian systems and specifically squad mates. So this isn't going to include uh, crocodilians and it will not include turtles, but I will be talking about squamata, which is the group that contains lizards and snakes. And we study lizards and snakes for a variety of reasons. And one of those is because we see such enormous amounts of variation within these groups. We have uh, crocodile lizards, for example, this one right here, which is biting its tail to kind of arch itself and really make those uh, spines and that dermal armor protrude out for protection. We have this diadophus shown right here, which is flipping over the posterior half of its body, showing these bright colors and that bright red tail so that it doesn't get eaten. And uh, this is a harmless species. 
but also flipping over its red tail is this uh, venomous Calliophis uh, that is found in Southeast Asia. We have snakes and we have lizards that are massive, like we have boas and pythons and enormous geckos that are found in New Caledonia. And then we have these tiny little Rakesia chameleons shown right here on a match head. And we also have radiations of a variety of groups in the Caribbean. Now, my specialty is snakes. And as I mentioned, snakes are in this group that contains uh, lizards as well. And the real way to look at this is similar to how humans are in a group that contains primates, snakes are in the group that contains lizards. So a real better way to view this tree is shown like this. So what does that mean? That actually means that snakes are really just some fancy lizards that have lost their limbs. And you might think that that would impede them, but they've actually done a great job at adapting to a variety of lifestyles. So there are tons of reasons why we could study snakes. And no, not just because snakes are the best organism out there and the coolest ones, might I add, but also because they serve as an excellent system for asking broader questions in evolutionary biology. So for example, we could look at adaptation. We can study morphology and behavior of self-defense like rattles and rattlesnakes, putting behaviors in cobras or tail flipping, such as what we saw in the previous slide. We can study adaptive and rapid radiations Snakes have diversified into nearly every habitat type there is. There are snakes that are terrestrial, so they're on the ground. There are snakes that are fossorial, living underneath the ground, like this blind snake on the right, or ones that are living in aquatic systems like rivers or lakes, or even in the marine realm, like sea snakes and sea crates that are found in the ocean. And there are even snakes that are found up in the trees or in the canopy, which are living in our boreal lifestyle. Snakes are also widely recognized now as being important for human medicine, as many of the proteins that are found in the venoms of a lapid shown on the left or vipers like on the right, that trimerosaurus, uh, can be very useful um, in targeting human disease. And if we wanna shift this kind of to an ecosystem perspective, snakes are really important as predators. They help balance out the ecosystem and control populations uh, whether those be pests or whether those be just whatever they're eating, such as rodents, herbivores, uh, fish, amphibians, small mammals, or even other snakes. So let's kind of shift over to talking about the Philippines biodiversity hotspot. And for anybody that isn't familiar with biodiversity hotspots, these are regions that have a very large percentage of endemism of flora and fauna. So right here, we have the Philippines and we can kind of uh, superimpose this into its greater position within Southeast Asia. And what we see is that we have several routes that can act as dispersal routes or colonization routes into the Philippines. We have Taiwan north of the Philippines. So while there is not tons of evidence of uh, a northern dispersal route into the Philippines, this has been found using crocodile shrews. There's also the southern route from Wallacea, and there are also the two uh, chains from uh, uh, connecting off of Borneo, such as Palawan and the Sulu Archipelago right here. And so uh, Philippine bulbuls have been uh, known, or at least some of the species are found to have colonized the Philippines from the Sulu Archipelago. And also one thing that's important to know is that mainland Southeast Asia used to be connected to the greater Sunda islands of Sumatra and Borneo through these uh, Pleistocene land bridges. And so this has a facilitated gene flow and migration from the mainland into these islands and then subsequently into the Philippines. So this entire region is known as Sundaland that I had just mentioned. And so if you hear me say that there's a Sundaic origin of particular taxa in the Philippines, I'm referring to this region. So uh, some taxa that are thought to have come from Sundalin are Sinopterus bats, which are hypothesized to have migrated over Palawan. And then also there's been evidence to show, at least in Sundalin, there's, that there's been gene flow. And a study was just published this year showing that there is likely gene flow through some of the greater Sunda islands. So this really kind of just goes to show you that these land bridges could be really important for dispersal routes and for the diversity that we see today. Even within the Philippines, uh, I just mentioned that these land bridges are important, but this also goes to show that looking at the geological history is really important for understanding biodiversity that we see today. So what I'm about to show you is a huge simplification uh, in a geological context 
But let's just say we take the largest islands of the Philippines, Luzon and Mindanao. These islands used to uh, be composed, or I'm sorry, um, the way these islands had formed was through these paleo islands or smaller land masses that have crashed together millions of years ago and formed the present day islands. So another thing that is important to note is that Palawan is considered this microcontinental block that has rafted into its current position today. And while there's not tons of evidence to show that particular groups came on that microcontinental block that is Palawan, it has been shown that some gecko, some gecko and frog lineages um, have had a Palawan origin and then diversified into the Philippines. So those land bridges that I had mentioned in Sundalin took place uh, primarily in the Pleistocene. So this is a time period of about 2.5 million years ago to 11.7 thousand years ago. But we also see this within the Philippines as well. So it's been found that certain, uh, some studies have shown that populations of organisms within particular island groups are more closely related to each other than those outside of those island groups. And the reason for this is because it's found that those island groups used to have land connections during sea level minima in the Pleistocene. So these island groups are what's known as Pleistocene aggregate island complexes, which are also known as pikes. So if you ever hear me say uh, anything about a pike paradigm or a pike model of relatedness, I'm referring to this notion that populations within a pike are more closely related to each other than, the, from, than from those outside of that pike. This was also shown uh, in a recent study, just as an example of this, uh, that these frogs in the Philippines, uh, Oxidozyga, are broadly consistent with this pike paradigm, where we see close relatedness of these frogs for populations within pikes. So going back to kind of the Philippines biodiversity hotspot as a whole, all this geological history, whether we're talking about millions of years ago or even just within the last tens or hundreds of thousands of years, are a great um, uh, explanation of the diversity that we see today. There are endemic plants in the Philippines, such as this pitcher plant or the parasitic Rafflesia. There is a Sinara pond found in the Bicol Peninsula. There is the Philippine eagle and these bleeding heart pigeons. And for mammals, we know of the tamara and these giant golden crown flying foxes, which are the largest bats that are known in the world. And if we look at the reptiles, we have endemic crocodiles, endemic varanid lizards, as well as hydrosaurus sailfin lizards. And there's also these Brachymelis uh, slender, slender skinks that are found in the Philippines as well. And interestingly, these skinks are an example that not all species will follow this pike paradigm. So this actually shows right here in this phylogeny that certain species from the greater Mindanao pike are closely related with those from the greater Luzon pike, but not all of the greater Mindanao species grouped together, as you can see in this tree, and not all of the greater Luzon uh, species are each other's closest relatives either. So this is um, support that there has been colonization and dispersal between pikes in the Philippines. So moving on to talking about Philippine snakes, uh, there are 142 species in the Philippines and we see a huge diversity of these snakes. They have different natural histories, different uh, ways they've gotten into the Philippines likely. We see different colors, different sizes of snakes, and also very unique behaviors, such as these Chrysopelia snakes that quote unquote fly, that actually glide uh, from the canopies. So out of this 142 species, 62% are endemic, so that's 88 species. And there are 46 genera, six of which are endemic, which include Oxyrhabdium, Myrosophus, Cyclochorus, and Hologarum, and the recently described Levitonius, which uh, was discussed not too long ago by my friend Jeff Wynett. And what's been found is that these five genera actually comprise this lineage that is actually now considered a family in the Philippines and are very distinct from other snake families. And this is really interesting because it's thought that many of the snakes in the Philippines have colonized the archipelago from outside land masses, but it looks like the cyclochoridae are, uh, are an example of a radiation that happened within the Philippines. 
The sixth genus is going to be uh, Hemibungaris, but I will talk about that later. And uh, also there are 12 families of snakes in the Philippines and the one endemic family are those cyclochordons. So snakes are, uh, we know a lot less about snakes compared to many other groups. And this is because they have very secretive lifestyles. They like to hide away, they're really good at tucking themselves into hard to reach areas. And in general, sometimes they just are found in very difficult to reach areas in terms of their habitat. So for example, I study homolopsid snakes and many of these species are found in mangroves and they're nocturnal. So it's difficult to navigate through man uh, mangroves in the daytime, let alone at nighttime when you can't even see anything. But it's important in that we know that snakes can serve as very valuable systems for a variety of reasons, whether that's looking at uh, biogeographic related hypotheses or whether we just want to know if there are particular lineages that warrant conservation concern. And so what are our next steps? We can use phylogenetics and use a systematic framework to uh, test particular evolutionary hypotheses, or we can use morphology and look at the distinctiveness of particular populations. And these are kind of uh, two paradigms that I'm going to go over later in this talk. So I want to give you all a brief introduction to homolapsed snakes, which are known as mud snakes. And the reason is because, as shown in this photo, they're commonly found in very muddy substrates, or at least in rivers and streams, lakes, and other aquatic systems, including peat swamps. So uh, the homolopsid is a family that contains uh, 55 species, and there is tons of variation and very unique species within this group. One example that I'd like to show is the tentacled snake. And while they're not actually tentacles, they have these rostral appendages on their face that are actually mechanoreceptors. And what they, uh, these mechanoreceptors are highly innervated by the trigeminal nerve of the brain, which allows these snakes to become voracious predators. And they're very uh, tactful. They sit and wait in the water. They wait for fish to come and swim by. And then they'll flicker a loop in their body and trick the fish into swimming towards their mouth and eat the and eat their prey. There are two major groups of homolopsid snakes. There are the fangless homolopsids. So these have very flat heads and lack any fangs. And there's about 10 species in three genera. And then the other group are these rear fanged homolopsids. And this group is much more specious. There are about uh, 45 species in 26 genera. And these snakes are equipped with this grooved fang in the back of the mouth, which is used to deliver a venom to incapacitate their prey. And while they are venomous, uh, this venom would not harm a human. I published a paper earlier this year with some colleagues that showed the rear fang group is sister to the fangless group, and they diverged from each other about 45 million years ago, and that many of the geological events that have happened in the last a couple hundred thousand years to a couple million years have influenced the diversification of this group. Now, the reason why I'm talking about homolopsis snakes is because three species, or at least two, are found in the Philippines. Gerardo Provoziana is uh, considered to be in the Philippines, but it's been decades since it's actually been seen. So we're kind of, uh, we're going to put that to the side and not really talk about that. But what I want to focus on are these, what are called dog-faced water snakes, which are in the genus Cerberus. And there are two species in the Philippines. The Cerberus schneideri, which is widespread throughout Southeast Asia, highlighted in green right here. This is their distribution. And Cerberus microlepis is found to be endemic to Lake Buki on the Bicol Peninsula in Luzon. So uh, I've kind of just overlaid those land bridges that we see in Sundalin. And the thing is, when it comes to these populations, we don't really know anything about how they've diversified throughout this entire region. We don't know if they've come from the southern route of dispersal into the Philippines or through Palawan or the Sulu Archipelago, or even from Taiwan. There are very few records of them being in Taiwan, but some of them do exist. So what I wanna know is how did Cerberus get into the Philippines through what dispersal route and how they diversified in the Philippines? And also do they follow this pike paradigm of population structure where we see populations being more related within those uh, island complex groups? So this is important for a variety of reasons. We can look at natural history and we can look at the uh, ecosystem roles that these snakes uh, play. We can look at alpha diversity. So are there undescribed lineages of Cerberus in the Philippines? 
we can test biogeographic related hypotheses. So for example, looking at how Pleistocene sea level fluctuations have influenced population structure both in and out of the Philippines. And also conservation. Cerberus micromepis is considered an endangered species, but we really don't know anything about its natural history, about its population structure. And there is some evidence that has shown that Cerberus micromepis might be a population of Cerberus schneideri. But even if that is the case, it could still be really important for the functioning of the Lake Bugi ecosystem. So here I'm going to talk about the uh, first case study, which is the investigation of Cerberus genetic diversity. And this is in co uh, collaboration with uh, those at the University of Kansas, as well as many in the Philippines and from my lab under Dr. Sarah Ruan at Rutgers University in Newark. So this is gonna be kind of a bit of a travelogue as well. So we went to the Philippines in 2019 for 30 days for a preliminary expedition just to find populations of Cerberus. So uh, we flew into Manila and uh, went to Legaspi and I got to see the beautiful Mount own for the first time, which was incredible. And there I met one of the most incredible field teams that I have had the pleasure of working with. And I'm super stoked that this is only the beginning. Uh, so my field team consisted of Dr. Ray Brown from the University of Kansas, Dr. Tess Sanguila from Father Santonino Odios University, and Docs Cuesta and Flores from Adeneo de Naga University, as well as Joe Bautista, also from Adeneo de Naga. And if any of you are watching, uh, I'm happy to say that I am wearing my, uh, my Adeneo de Naga shirt that you bought me, and I am happy uh, to represent that. Um, anyways. So going back to this, the region that we were particularly interested in was on the Bicol Peninsula and specifically looking at Lake Buki. It's been known that Cerber Schneideri is widely distributed throughout the Philippines, but it's been decades since there's been any studies that have reported on Cerberus Marcolipus, which would be the Cerberus populations that are in this lake. This lake is only a couple hundred years old and was formed when an avalanche, co an avalanche caused a, uh, a damming one of the nearby rivers. So we went to uh, this lake and again, just to kind of uh, let you know the difference between the two species, we're looking for Cerberus schneideri, which is this widespread species throughout Southeast Asia and in the Philippines and is commonly found in salt waters or brackish waters or in mangroves. And then we're also looking for Cerberus microlepis, which is a lot less reported on and is this Buhi endemic and is only found in the freshwater lake of Lake Buhi. So uh, I had a lot of help from many different people such as Sir Rico, um, uh, who is from Lake Buhi and did a great job at putting us in touch with a variety of individuals, as well as the mayor of Buhi and their team. And I'm so thankful for allowing, for having them to allow us to check out all different parts of the lake so we can learn more about these populations. So we looked at a variety of different habitats. We looked at the areas of the lake near where the boats are docked. We looked at the rice paddies around the lake, as many homolopsids are known to heavily inhabit these uh, ecosystems, even if they're uh, man-made. And also we looked at the rivers that flow in and out of Lake Buhi. And as we don't know really anything about the natural history of these populations, Joward and I had also collected measurements of water call quality for downstream analyses to see if there's anything that could be affecting these populations if they do turn out to be quite distinct. We also checked out some of the barangays that are around Lake Buhi. And so uh, specifically, we went to Ibayugan and we got onto a boat, the Sofia, and did a great job at taking us around the lake and checking out a variety of habitats. So uh, this was really fun and we got to check a variety of different areas. However, we didn't have much luck in finding any of these snake populations. However, we made sure to go back at night for some night expeditions because these snakes are commonly reported to be very active at night and many homolopsids are known to be nocturnal. So we checked out the same areas plus some additional areas around the lake and some of these streams. And sure enough, we were actually able to find populations of Cerberus. And we were able to take some pretty cool natural history notes. It seems that Cerberus microlepis takes part in the same uh, escape behavior as other species, which is this sidewinding behavior when it is on land. And it does a very good job at doing this to get away from predators. And in this case, it thinks that I'm the predator. Um, and we also took some really cool photographs of these snakes, 
which are the first live photographs of this species yet. I also like to show this video right here, which is Cerberus megalipus uh, swimming up this stream when we were taking photographs. And this is kind of just to show how well these snakes can uh, swim through these riverine systems. And it seems that these snakes are just as good at swimming downstream as they are uh, at swimming upstream. And most of the time they were found swimming upstream. So uh, Jordan and I continue collecting these measurements of water quality, as well as documenting the areas that we would check on further expeditions. Now, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we were not able to come back, but we do have plans in the works to check out these regions again. But before I kind of go into the preliminary data that we do have, uh, I do want to mention that uh, we also tried finding populations of Cerberus schneideri. And so Dr. Cuesta did a great job of putting us in touch with those in the municipality of Magadao, specifically at uh, Ponong, off of Don Celia Island. And so there we met another team and everyone was super kind and did a great job at uh, taking us around the island and other river systems for us to find a variety of animals. We saw geckos, we saw these Ahetula vine snakes, many of which uh, photos are shown with the green morph, but we found this yellow morph. We found the Philippine endemic duck, as well as these Kalula frogs. And one of the cool observations we made was uh, an Acrocortis granulatus that was caught in a fishing net. So these are these little file snakes uh, that are shown right here. And this actually ended up being a range extension within the Philippines for the snake. And it also regurgitated this purple eel goby which has yet to been documented. So Jordan and I published on this last year in Herbatological Review, which is our first official uh, collaborative publication for uh, the both of us. And to top all that off, we also found populations of Cerberus schneideri in Magadao. And then after that, we were able to kind of communicate with everybody else in the community to kind of educate everybody on snakes and why they're important for the ecosystem. And it was a really fun time uh, having everybody kind of pull together so we could learn more about these animals. So along with field expeditions, I also utilize natural history collections. The natural history collections in natural history museums are not only great for teaching the general public and educating them on what kind of research goes on in the sense of biodiversity and where different studies take place, but they also act as a repository for us to look at tissue or look at specimens and acquire tissues from prior research to help us with the current research that is going on. So using both of these methods, I was able to get tissues and I extracted DNA. So I was able to extract mitochondrial DNA from those tissues which is very useful for looking at recent relationships in evolutionary histories and then also nuclear dna which is useful for looking at the uh, for look for looking at the older relationships um, when we're looking at the evolutionary process and i amplified those genes from the dna using polymerase chain reaction and then we use computer software to create these dna alignments and these dna alignments are looking at the similarities and differences between our sequences amongst our specimens. And then what we do is we concatenate them. So that means we take the different genes that we've sequenced, paste them together, and we compare those across all of our specimens, in this case, Cerberus. And then we input that to computer softwares for phylogenetic analysis. And what these analyses do is they look at the probability of data, in this case, our nucleotides, given a hypothesis. And in this case, that hypothesis is the evolutionary model on a tree. So this is how we get our phylogeny. Now, I'm going to show this phylogeny, and I'm going to kind of slowly go through it and kind of give you the story. So the outgroup of our tree is Cerberus australis. So that is going to be the Australian species of the genus. And then there are two groups. There is the sister species to Schneideri, so that's Cerberus rinkops. And then we have all the other species of Cerberus. So right here, I've kind of added onto the screen all of the localities that these specimens are from. And we notice a few things. One, we do not see that all the Philippines specimens are each other's closest relatives. If that were the case, we would have expected them to all group together. But instead, what we see is that we have specimens from mainland Southeast Asia, shown right here, 
um, it's specimens from the islands of Timor and Pulau coming out embedded with the group that has our Philippine specimens. Those black circles on the tree indicate strong support, and some of our relationships are not strongly supported, but I'll talk more about that after. Um, the age of this group is around 290,000 years ago, which would be when we would be seeing these land bridge connections. So right here, I brought up a map to kind of show how these snakes may have diversified based off of this tree, off of our current data, which is a little limited. But essentially, what we would see is we have these snakes, uh, these populations of Cerberus in Myanmar, and they had diversified to mainland Southeast Asia, Peninsular Malaysia, and the Philippines. And then from there, they diversified within the Philippines and also diversify, uh, uh, left the Philippines and colonized the islands of Timor and Palau. So in terms of looking at colonization routes of how they've gotten to the Philippines, it's really inconclusive which route they took. We don't know if they took the southern route or if they went through Palawan or the Sula Archipelago or maybe even through Taiwan, which is probably unlikely. But based off of what we have so far, it might be that they went through, uh, or that there might be Sudaic origin of Philippine Cerberus. Now we don't have sampling from the island of Borneo or in Wallacea or Taiwan. So this is why we can't really say for sure what the most likely colonization route is. Also other questions include how they were able to get to faraway islands such as Timor and Pulau, as what we notice is that they, uh, the populations from Timor and Pulau are younger than those from the ones in the Philippines and mainland Southeast Asia. Now, looking at if they follow this pike paradigm of relatedness, we notice that the specimen from Bohol is shown highlighted right here from the greater Mindanao pike. And then specimens from Sorsagon, as well as Polilo and Quezon, are from the greater Mindanao Pike, or I'm sorry, the greater Luzon Pike. And what you'll notice is that they are not each other's closest relatives. So right there, we already have evidence against this pike paradigm of relatedness. And furthermore, the specimens from Lake Buhi, Cerberus microlepis, come out as sister to those from the Visayan Islands. And this is actually evidence that Cerberus microlepis might just be a freshwater population, as they do all cluster together, but it might just be a freshwater population of Cerberus schneideri, and also Cerberus donsoni might just be a founder population of Cerberus schneideri as well. So um, again, we do not see that specimens from uh, island groups that are the pikes are each other's closest relatives for all of our specimens. And again, this is just based off of our sampling. Uh, this specimen from Sorsagon might actually be somewhere in this Philippines group, which would kind of change our story. But this is why we need more sampling of other pikes as well as more uh, DNA. This would also help us answer the questions of colonization routes such as whether they went through Palawan or maybe the Sulu Archipelago and how they could have gotten to Palau and Timor, which may have been from uh, Mindanao. So again, we need to increase our sampling as this is just preliminary, preliminary data, but it is possible that there might be uh, multiple colonizations and that there may be a Sundaic origin of Philippine Cerberus. We also see that there's little genetic diversity within the Philippines. I didn't show this, but the genetic distances between all those populations is very small and would not really uh, be supportive of multiple species. And again, there might be these multiple founder events as evidenced by the clustering of the Buhi specimens, the Timor specimens, and the Pula specimens. Now, while we were doing this research, we also uh, got to see something else that was really cool. And kind of looking back at my photos, maybe it was, you know, maybe it was fake that this is going to happen, as there were many road signs that were very snaky. And then also I spent a fair amount of time during one of the breaks in Presentacion uh, playing with uh, puppies in the road as well as some toy snakes. Uh, I know, hard at work. Um, but one of the cool things that happened was that somebody alerted to us to a dead snake in the road, which was this Hemibungaris. And if you recall, Hemibungaris is that sixth genus that I mentioned, is in, which is endemic to the Philippines. So this kind of shifts me over into that next case study, which is looking at this diversity assessment of the Philippine endemic Hemibungaris. 
Now, the other study that I had showed used molecular, molecular data, and this is fantastic in that it can uh, allow us to test particular biogeographic hypotheses and other evolutionary hypotheses, but we can't always rely on DNA as tissue is not always available. We need tissue to get the, uh, to get the DNA from, and sometimes there are just particular species where there are no tissues available, or we don't have tissues from particular populations uh, like what we saw with Cerberus, where none exist, for example, the Wallacea populations. So you need to rely on the data that you are able to obtain. And in this case, I use morphological data. So again, this is going to be looking at the physical appearance of specimens. So this is going to be focusing on hemibungaris, which are also known as false coral snakes. And the reason for this is because they look a lot like coral snakes. They have this intricate banding pattern. They have these really bright colors. Uh, their general morphology, but also some of their anatomy, such as their head shape, is very reminiscent of coral snakes. However, these are actually more closely related to cobras than to any of the actual coral snakes uh, of Asian origin or ones that are found in the New World. So since they're more closely related, or actually they're in the group that includes cobras, these are elapid snakes, which is a uh, venomous group of snakes. They are terrestrial, and they are that does mean they are venomous, being in the family elapidae, but the potency of this venom is something that we don't really know about. There have been some reports that do talk about envenomation. However, it was really just one report and symptoms cleared up within a couple of days or within a week. So it's uncertain if that is just an envenomation that was very slight or if the potency of the venom is just really not that severe. There are three species, the Temibungaris caligaster, McClungi, and Gemiannulus. And not much is known about these three species. There have been some natural history studies and some papers that have shown that they might be part of a mimicry system for the larvae of these Broca moths that are found in Southeast Asia, as well as in the Philippines. And in terms of their phylogenetic relationships, it's found that they're the sister species to king cobras, which is absolutely incredible and really shocking. These two groups of snakes are very different from each other. Hemivungaris are the snakes that are you know, at most around 50 centimeters, so like a half a meter, and King Cobras can get to between three and four meters. Uh, Hemibungaris compared to King Cobras are very thin, where King Cobras are very stocky. Uh, if the venom is very, uh, I don't want to say weak, but, you know, uh, very mild in hemibungaris. We know that king cobras have a very potent neurotoxin, and hemibungaris are found in systems in the forest floors, uh, whereas king cobras are known to be around water systems or kind of grasslands or similar areas. And also, on top of all of that, um, hemibungaris are known to be pretty docile, whereas king cobras, if you start toying around with king cobra, you're probably not going to get a docile response. Looking at the ontogenetic shifts of hemibungaris, it is found that the juveniles are these uh, integrate red and black alternating bands. The head has these temporal regions that lack melanin, so that means that they're not dark in color. Whereas the adults, shown over on the right, have this melanistic pigment in the temporal regions, except for gemiannulus. The juveniles also have this interorbital stripe and these white heads. And there are no white dorsal annuli, which are these dorsal white stripes shown on the top of the adults. Um, now, the way that hemibungaris are differentiated from each other, since we don't really have molecular data for all the species, and there's only a few tissues known really in the world, um, is based off of color pattern. So right here, we have the dorsal color pattern, which is the top of the snake, and the ventral color pattern, which is going to be the belly side of the snake. And this is just a general schematic of their scales. So some of the terminology you'll hear me use is going to be these black and orange bands, which are these broad black and broad orange bands on the dorsal and ventral surfaces. We have these ventral bars, which are the white scales that are in the middle of the black bands of the ventral side. So that's shown right here in Hemibungaris monkungi. Jemmy annulus also has these, just not shown in this photo. And then we have these dorsal white annuli and then these thinner white annuli that are in between those thicker ones. And a great photo is actually from iNaturalist that shows this. And you can see that there are these thick dorsal annuli and then these thinner white ones. And those thinner white ones usually coincide with that ventral bar. So 
another way that we differentiate, uh, or I'm sorry, I jumped, I jumped ahead. Um, so again, they are prelimin or they're primarily distinguished from each other based off of these color patterns shown right here with these schematics. So Hemibungaris caligaster does not have those ventral bars or those thin white annuli shown here. And then McClungy and Gemi annulus do have the ventral bars and the thin white annuli. And because of that, they usually have a higher number of these total white annuli. And looking at the phenotypes of their heads, Caligaster and McClungy have very similar phenotypes in that the melanistic region is pigmented, and then the uh, uh, species Gemi annulus lacks this, and that temporal region is usually either yellow or orange or red. They're also known to have distinct distributions, and this is more of a hypothesis. It's hypothesized that Caligaster is limited uh, to central and northern parts of the island of Luzon, while McClungy is restricted to the Beagle Peninsula. And then finally, Gemi annulus to some of the islands of the Visayas. So because there are, there's no DNA available across all these species to look at their phylogenetic relationships or to know how many species, what we wanted to do was to determine the morphologic distinctiveness using quantitative means. So essentially, does their morphology, both color pattern, as well as other traits such as scale characters or continuous measurements, coincide with the named taxa, taxa that are these three species? And also, we wanted to, to assess if the distribution patterns for Hemibungaris throughout the Philippines coincide with the hypothesis that I had just mentioned on the other slide. So to do this, we got 98 specimens from 15 natural history collections, as well as four observations from iNaturalist. And we documented and observed the color characters that I mentioned on the other slide. So those scale patterns and uh, banding patterns, as well as scale characteristics. So this is going to be counting ventral scales, scales on the tail, scales on the head, dorsal scale rows, and also continuous measurements, which would be things like head length, head width, the tail length, and uh, body length and body width measurements. And then with all of this, I re-identified the Hemibungaris from the natural history collections because almost all of the specimens in natural history collections, which aren't many, this is probably 90% of all that is probably found in the world, um, are identified using old taxonomy. So you can't rely on georeferencing them without looking at their morphology first. So I re-identify them and then georeference them and use multivariate statistics such as principal coordinates analysis and linear discriminant analysis, also known as PCOA and LDA, to look at uh, to, uh, to see if the morphology will really tease apart the relationships of the three species, given that they are species. So these analyses will pretty much tell us, yes, they do have very different morphologies from each other, or no, it's very likely that these are all the same based off of morphology. And this LDA also is a really cool analysis is in that it incorporates machine learning, meaning you train the analysis with your own data set to see if the analysis itself will identify the species in the same manner that I did. So that means I had to create groups for the analyses. I use the name taxa as well as this intermediate population called HCF McClungy because I found that it has an intermediate phenotype between Caligaster and McClungy. Caligaster lacks those ventral bars, and McClungy has these very distinct bars, and these snakes had faded bars, and intermediate scale counts as well uh, were an intermediate size. So if we look at the, uh, the PCOA first, we see that looking at PC1, so this is going up and down, we really have two groups. We have uh, Jemmy annulus here, and then Caligaster McClungy and CF McClungy form one group. And if we look upward along PC1, they have this uh, slight overlap, but there's evidence of there being two groups there. And if we look at PC2, we see that Jemmy annulus and Caligaster overlap with each other, and they are distinct from McClungy. What we'll also notice is that that intermediate CF McClungy comes out in the middle of the morphospace connecting Caligaster and McClungy. And to get a, bitter, uh, a better representation of this visually, here is what this would look like in a 3D representation. So this is the same chart that you're seeing on the left, just to show you that we see we would see three clusters if we did not include that green intermediate sea of McClungy population. But with those, it looks like there is evidence that 
McClungy and Calagasser and CF McClungy might be one species with these intermediate green population shown here, maybe being uh, a hybrid of the two species. Um, and that it's, or it's just variation of one very widespread species. Now the LDA shows some different results. This cross-validation, which is the accuracy of identification using our analysis was 98.7%. So that means that all of what I called Caligaster was identified in the analysis as Caligaster. Same thing for Jemmy annulus for all 20 specimens and McClungy, but one CF McClungy was actually identified as a Caligaster, but the rest were correctly identified. So on the right, here's what our LDA shows. And to kind of break this down, basically what this is showing is that this plot shows LD1, and this is showing that the CF McClungy and McClungy are pretty much the same, and they differ pretty substantially from Caligaster and Gemmy annulus. And then along LD2, so this is going from left to right, we say that there's kind of support for four different groups. So what this means is that we have either evidence of two species or evidence of four species, but we really don't know how those intermediate sea of McClungy populations play a role in all of this in terms of species limits. If we look at the geographic distributions of these taxa, we find that Jemmy annulus is indeed uh, restricted based off of what we have to the Visayan Islands, and that Caligaster is restricted to central Luzon as well as Mindoro. But McClungy is not just restricted to the Beagle Peninsula, it's actually more widely distributed. One thing that I also want to point out is that interestingly enough, those CF McClungy, that intermediate population, comes out kind of where we see an overlap of Caligaster and McClungy. And this is just left of the Guinayangan Fault. So this fault is actually where the two major parts of Luzon had collided together. And right next to that is the Tayabas Isthmus. And there have been other studies that have shown that whenever we have a very thin strip of land shown right here, we can actually have unidirectional flow or a filter zone of one population into the other. So this might represent uh, that this is a zone of secondary contact with gene flow going from the east to the west, which would be why, uh, possibly why we see Caligaster and McClungy mostly to the left of this fault line. So this work uh, will require more field work and increased geographic sampling, as well as looking at genomic data to assess the degree of hybridization and species limits within these populations. And this study will be published uh, fairly soon as it was just accepted to theology and herpetology. So all in all, uh, some of my take home messages are really choose the best system based off of what you have. So for example, I was able to get molecular data and I do have more morphologic data of those Cerberus populations, but sometimes that's not available and that's completely okay. There are tons of really awesome talk, uh, uh, awesome uh, studies that use morphological data. So this is what I had done with Hemibungaris. And also, even though resources are sometimes limited, don't limit yourself. Go and look at the source data, look at what natural history collections have to offer and field notes as well as specimens. And the internet also has tons of amazing repositories for different types of data. So with that said, I'd like to just acknowledge the funding and support from my committee, as well as my advisor um, for all of their help, as well as NSF for funding for field work and for lab work, and to all of the curatorial staff at a variety of museums for uh, taking photos of specimens and uh, loaning me specimens, and also to all those in the Philippines who had done such an amazing job at making me feel so at home, teaching me so much about the culture, the language, um, the traditions and just really facilitating my knowledge and also for showing me some really amazing food that I cannot wait to get back to because that was I have more photos of food than I do of reptiles so anyways thank you so much and I would be happy to answer any questions all right thank you very much Justin for that great presentation so everyone but uh, before we go to the Q&A I know marami kayong mga itatanong uh, but before that, we will have our uh, promise quiz so that you will have more time to think of your questions. How many snake species are there in the Philippines? You have 10 seconds. I think that's easy. Is that easy? 
So 79% of you answered that there are more than 100. So the correct answer is yes. Uh, option C, there are more than 100 snake species in the Philippines. Is What country does... Uh, uh, that, does it have uh, you know a thousand? Do you know? Would there be a, uh, would there be a region or a country that has a more than one thousand snake species? Uh no, no. It's not that I'm aware. Of. <laughs> no, there's no. <laughs> there, there, there are certainly countries that have an amazing amount and like several hundreds of species. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of a thousand, there's you know there's close to four thousand species of snakes. <laughs> All right. The next question is. Out of the following, snakes are most closely related to turtle, alligators, and crocodiles, worms, and the last option is a lizard. And 86% uh, answered lizards. And that option is correct. Why so? Why is it? Why is it lizards? Yeah. Can you expound, yeah. Justin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, snakes, when we look at the phylogeny of squam mates, which include lizards and snakes, are found to be embedded within the group that contains lizards. So that means if we were to look at the ancestral lineage, that first lineage of reptiles within squamata, we would find something that is lizard-like. And then from there, as time went on, we see that there are several groups of reptiles that have actually lost, or of lizards that have lost their limbs. And mm -hmm. one of those groups are what we call snakes. And there are ways to differentiate between limbless lizards and then the limbless lizards that we know as snakes. All right. Okay. Snakes so just get their own name. Yeah, but are there like <laughs> uh, first cousins, second cousins, third cousins, or? A lot. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> okay. Our third question is: What is the past? Oh, what is, what is the term for these groups of Philippine islands that were joined together in the past? So is it PAICs, PLMGs, IGs, and IATMs? I think everyone will get this right. Let's see. That's around ninety-two uh, percent. There are some of you who answered uh, the. Option B and D, but the answer is uh, it's A. Yeah. Pleistocene aggregate island complexes. Our next question: Why are snakes so important and worth protecting? Let's see. And. A lot of you answered all of the above. Let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. What happened? It was correct. <laughs> okay. Okay. All the above. All right. I don't know why. Okay. Next, what is the one purpose of uh, natural history collections in museums? I realize the wording of my question on this one is kind of deceiving. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it so, but it seems it was but it seems it was okay. Yeah. So uh both B and C. Let's see. Okay, 71% of them good. got it. Good. Okay. It is it is important although, to note that that now say again. Uh, although there are natural history collections in museums that uh, you know are for Profit oriented? Are there in the museum? Yeah, yeah, of course. There are definitely ones that uh, do use particular profits. Although, I guess my main point is that, you know, the collection of specimens is not for a monetary purpose. Mm -hmm. It's really to provide a safe house, honestly, for history. Um, yeah, right. You know, really, what we're naturally history collections are a window into the history of evolution and biodiversity of all lineages. All right. Okay. And I. Uh, I think this is the sixth question. Where are Cerberus snakes found most often in the Philippines? Under the soil, up in the trees, rivers and lakes, and above ground in the forest. And let's see. 83% answered in rivers and lakes, and they are correct. Thank you. And I think this is the last. Is it this last? Yes. How can yeah. you tell the difference between a juvenile and an adult hemibungurus or false coral snake? Is it by color pattern, behavioral differences, comparing or by comparing their DNA, 
or comparing the number of scales they have. So a lot of them, 76% answered color pattern differences and they are correct. They are good. And good. And we have, oh, we have Dwayne, Dwayne, <laughs> we have Dwayne Dirac Johnson. Sorry, you, that's uh, what you call, that's a, that's a pseudonym, but he was able to answer correctly. Seven out of seven in uh, 32 seconds. And we have uh, Kirk Tarai, uh, oh. <laughs> in a close, uh, close uh, second. All right. Maraming salamat. Okay, we have a question here already from, uh, we have some people here. Okay, let me just uh, change my view. Okay. Let's start with uh, Keanu, Rod Pelinia. Oh, I'm sorry. Willem Joshua Tan, and he was able to put in four questions already. We'll just uh, go go through one um, one by one. I wonder where did you get some of the DNA samples for Cerberus like the ones from Visayas? Okay, so uh, yeah, I guess I'll go through. So in terms of the ones uh, from the Visayas, these were actually from previous uh, collection efforts. So the tissues that I was able to obtain for these come from the uh, natural history collection at the University of Kansas. So this is also with my collaboration with Dr. Rafe Brown from over there, who is also part of this team, like I had mentioned, as we're investigating these Philippines populations. So this is kind of the benefit where we can use previous collection efforts, as well as already published DNA sequences on online repositories to help supplement our data sets. So that's where those uh, DNA, DNA sequences and samples came from. Yeah, that's so that's uh, how important uh, the collections at, of the Natural History Museums. Yeah, is, uh, do you want me? Oh, sorry, go on. Uh, uh, yeah, go on. Well, I was going to say, do you want me to go through those four questions? Yeah, yeah. So in your, uh, in your observation, is there a lot of persecution of Cerberus in, the, in that area? Mm -hmm. uh, also, do you think it's the biggest issue with the conservation of the Philippine Cerberus? Um, so uh, I did not particularly see uh, any Cerberus being, uh, you know, killed, but mm -hmm. I do know that it happens. Uh, it happens with pretty much all snakes. And when it comes to these kind of things, uh, I do really try to come from a point of understanding because uh, it's not on me to try to tell someone they're wrong, someone they're wrong about how they view a snake. So all I can really do is kind of try to educate others. But in the Philippines, I didn't really hear about this, but I have heard that in some areas, uh, it is considered that if there is, for example, a mudslide around like Buhi, uh, or if there's maybe some sort of other disastrous event, it might be noticed that there are more snakes in the area. And that mm -hmm. could be because these snakes get flushed out of their uh, riverine systems. And then, you know, you kind of tie two and two together and some might think, hey, these snakes appeared and something bad happened. Uh, so I, I haven't really heard of them being <laughs> killed, but I do know that there are other localities uh, and other islands in Southeast Asia where the snakes are so abundant that they are used as firewood. And I have uh, been sent photos of service piles in a fire. Um, and so it is a concern. However, I will say um, Cerberus might be the most abundant snake in Southeast Asia, at least in these aquatic systems. So in terms of its conservation, it doesn't sound too worrisome. It's not good to kill any snake. Uh, but also the other side of that coin is we don't know about how distinct all populations of Cerberus are within all the islands in Southeast Asia. All right. So third question from uh, Willem. Uh, he's curious on your conclusion that the uh, Hemibungaris is more closely related to uh, the King Cobra. Would uh, mm -hmm. Is the King Cobra closer to Mambas than the Hemibungaris? So, uh, yes. So Mambas uh, and Ophiophagus are very closely related. And looking at a few different studies, one of which was, I think, last year, uh, which was a master's thesis, used uh, several DNA samples to show that King Cobras and Hemibungaris are sister to each other, so they're each other's closest relatives, but still very close to those are the Mambas. 
And uh, this has also been shown in some older studies that are probably around like eight to 10 years now that have included one or two specimens of hemibungaris. Uh, what would really be useful is if we can get multiple tissues of hemibungaris, because usually when hemibungaris are in these phylogenetic studies, it, they're only represented by one or two tissues. Um, so it's going to be a long time until we can include several samples into phylogenetic studies, because again, this is going to take a lot of collection effort, and it's going to take uh, a lot of time finding those samples. Uh, and who knows, maybe some of you will be able to collaborate with us and we can all work together on that. All right. So last question from uh, Willem. Uh, how did you think uh, for Doña Lucubalia uh, ended up in the past list of Philippine snakes in the first place? Um, so what is really common, and I didn't really point this out in uh, my presentation of Hemibungaris, but some of you may have noticed that there is actually a Caligaster that is found on, or that is recorded as being from uh, Samar. And then there's a Gemiannulus that is recorded from being from Manila. And this is kind of what has happened with what we've seen for Fordonia. But typically when we have uh, locality records, what has been often uh, the case is that we will have a particular species and the locality record will say, for example, Manila. And what that locality record actually represents is it's not that the snake was found in Manila, Manila. but it's that, that this is the port of export when specimens were sent to museums in Europe. Uh, way back. So there are uh, a lot of records, not just in the Philippines, but elsewhere too, where we see this happen. So this is why uh, in the most recent checklist of the Philippines by uh, Jeff Lionel, they actually mentioned that Fordonia is not really going to be included there. But when it comes to Gerarda, Palawan is actually the location of this one specimen from, I think, 1987. All right. So uh, we have a question from Aaron Ortega, BS biology student from uh, Polytechnic University of the Philippines. And he's very interested in a very, in a specific family of snakes, the Acrocordidae. And he yeah. noticed that there are a primitive family of snakes and they inhabit a broad range of, broad range from Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia and Northern uh, Australia. And his question is how come a family of snake probably, um, uh, referring to Acrocordidae uh, that has been around for a, a long time already and thrive in a vast <laughs> distribution doesn't seem to have a, you know, it doesn't seem to be diverse compared to other families. Right. So this is actually a really great question. And this is also why um, I think sometimes we overlook these species that are just really unique. You know, you see an Acrocordis, it could be a super blurry photo and you're like, that's an acrocordis. And you see these really uh, distinct snakes and you kind of start to kind of just rely on that current taxonomy. But it's there's a lot of work that still needs to be done with acrocordates. And I actually know someone, um, uh, Dr. John Murphy, who uh, me and him have spoken about at investigating acrocordates as well. Uh, so feel free to get in touch with me. Um, but you know, this really boils down to there still needing to be a, uh, a study that really looks at the entire distribution of acrocordids with high sampling, both geographic and both with uh, high molecular sampling to really look at this diversity. So uh, in terms of if it, if it does happen to be that there is very little diversity, I really don't know the answer. That would be suggestive mm -hmm. of there being opportunity for gene flow and dispersal events and uh, for populations to come into contact with each, each other. Or if there is, it's simply just because we haven't discovered it yet. Yeah. So a question from Karen Ardes, uh, in your molecular work, what part of the snake do you extract for, uh, uh, for your uh, molecular studies? And uh, probably can you give the amount? So uh, when it comes to snakes, you can do a few things. You can take liver tissue. So this comes to when you have specimens that have been vouchered, they've been humanely euthanized, and they have been put into natural history collections, and tissue has been taken for subsequent use. So when it comes to um, uh, using liver tissue or muscle tissue, liver tissue is really good because there's more cells per unit area. And you only need a little bit. You need like a little like tiny fleck, um, like the size of a grain of rice would give you enough for two to three DNA extractions. 
Um, and that DNA extraction can last you quite a long time. You can also use tail tips, which you know, I personally don't recommend. There are other ways to do it, but you can use blood samples, which you would uh, do by using a needle and using the caudal vein to obtain uh, a blood sample. So that is a non-lethal way of getting a sample. Or you can take scale clips where you just take a little snippet of some of the scales on the snake, usually on the ventral side, on the side. And then you can use something like a liquid bandage to prevent infection and uh, facilitate the healing process. And that can easily give you DNA as well. All right, thanks. So uh, from Cyrus Job uh, de la Cruz, uh, are there any available published articles <coughs> regarding the mating behavior of hemibangarus? As of right now, there are no uh, published articles that show what their mating behavior is like, uh, at least not anything that I've seen and I've done uh, quite a literature search. And there's not much published literature on hemibangarus in general. One thing that I think is going to be super helpful is that there are um, individuals that are in the Philippines that I have come into contact with through Facebook, which is why I say do not doubt the power of the internet, because while some people say that ah, Facebook, Wikipedia, da, 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 you know, um, the truth of the matter is there are tons of species that have been discovered or rarely seen in 20 years. And I see people posting videos of these things. So um, I've gotten to touch with a few individuals that have shown me some really awesome photos of Hemibungaris. Mm -hmm. um, and actually one of those is uh, individuals is uh, now going to collaborate with me on their first paper um, due to a natural history observation of Hemibungaris and their defensive behaviors. So, um, you know, it's, it's really cool, and hopefully somebody will come across a mating pair of Emmy Vangaris. All right. Okay, a question from Paul Andrew Ibarra, probably very quickly. What equipment uh, do you use uh, during your field work? <laughs> There's a, there's, a, there's a lot of equipment to use during field work. Um, so I guess I'll kind of, uh, you know, ignore all the obvious things yeah, like yeah. boots and certain gear, <laughs> but uh, headlamps for one, as a lot of the snakes that we do find are nocturnal. Batteries, because uh, I've yet to find a headlamp, a headlamp that doesn't start to die within 40 to 60 <laughs> minutes of use. Um, bug spray, but in terms of equipment that I'm gonna be using for finding snakes, Mm -hmm. A snake hook or a stump ripper, this is more for moving objects rather than it is to getting snakes unless it's, a, if it's something venomous. And if there are venomous snakes, um, I always say if you don't need to work on them and you don't need to touch them, <laughs> yeah. don't touch them. Um, you know, I, I, I know there's that need to touch it, <laughs> um, but try to resist that urge. And if you do need to touch them and you are doing research on venomous snakes, uh, and you do need to really get up close with them. Um, what some people use are they either use snake bags, which you should have anyway, and someone mm -hmm. can kind of isolate the head if someone works on the back of the animal, or you can use these snake tubes, which are uh, made of this flexible plastic material, and you kind of work with two people, you get someone to angle the snake with a snake hook, get the head in the tube, and then the snake is safe, it's not harmed, it can't move around, and then you could hold the snake uh, and the snake can't turn around and bite you. Um, so there's a, there's a variety of different types of equipment. And um, I, sometimes I go a little crazy and I like to be inventive. Uh, I once brought a, uh, a gardening equipment and a, uh, a rope to make a hook to throw over trees so I can climb <laughs> trees. So I uh, get creative too. All right, so uh, <laughs> nice. From Joaquim Decena, is the dog-faced uh, water snake of Lake Buhi considered a locality species? Yes. So right, so right now, the Lake Buhi or Cerberus microlepis is considered to only be found from Lake Buhi. And while studies in the past, as well as mine, have shown evidence that is it's actually just a population of Cerberus schneideri, we still need genomic data to really determine if this is the case. And uh, within a couple of weeks, I will have genomic data on a lot of these populations uh, because my dissertation focuses on homolocid snakes. So uh, I will have that in hand and we will be able to determine what the deal is with those populations. But even if it does turn out to be not this Lake Buhi endemic, what is important to know is that the Lake Buhi specimens do cluster together as a population. So that does not mean that they don't serve some really important system or uh, purpose. 
or a role in the ecosystem of Lake Buhi. Um, and one thing to really consider is that this could be really important, not just for the fish populations in the lake, which there are a lot of introduced species in Lake Buhi, which have decimated past populations of other native fish. Um, but this could also be really important uh, for humans that rely on the fish in Lake Buhi. All right. So uh, from John Kenneth Dapar, uh, any suggestion for future researchers who wants to pursue this field of study? Uh, yeah, I can write a couple of books on it. Um, <laughs> uh, honestly, if I had to give kind of just some non-specific advice, you can always take your passion and turn it into an occupation. The matter is, how can you figure that out and how do you go about it? So one of the things that I think is really important is reach out to those that are doing this research, learn about their journey, learn about their story. My story started with me doing 15 years of veterinary experience, two years of human medicine, and two years of bartending too while I was in my master's <laughs> to push my way into veterinary, yeah, to push my way into veterinary school. And within six months of doing work in the lab of Aaron Bauer at, uh, for my master's at Villanova, within six months, I was hooked on doing research. So everyone has a different story and you're gonna find that there's a lot of uh, roadblocks in the way, but honestly, start reading papers, start looking up professors at universities or uh, talk to their grad students and kind of learn how you can find different labs that are doing this research and learn how they do that research. And then you could probably just apply to a program, uh, whether this is undergrad or grad school and learn how you can get into the research world. And once you do that, it's gonna take off like autopilot. Yeah, great advice. So from Christian Jason Ang, um, he heard that uh, there were two unconfirmed deaths from Hemi Bongaris, Caligaster, if um, memory serves him right. Um, mm -hmm. And the boat showed symptoms of myol myolysis. And there, and there are, like you mentioned, victims that recovered without intervention of antivenin. So how likely is the first statement? So uh, in terms of envenomations from Hemi Bongaris, I'm not sure how likely it is just because when it comes to the unconfirmed deaths, these snakes can be mistaken for other species that can give a pretty, um, a pretty nasty bite. So it's really difficult to say when it comes to the quote unquote unconfirmed cases, because you don't know if you are dealing with a different species or if this actually is a bite from a hemibungaris and it turns out that they actually do have a very potent venom. So uh, I'm really not sure. I know that the uh, one report by Marin Galk in her uh, uh, field guide to the herbs of Panay involved, I don't think there was really much medical intervention and that within a few days, the symptoms had subsided. I think that was a bite on the toe. Mm -hmm. um, so really, honestly, who knows? It's tough to say. I know that for me, if I was dealing with hemibungaris, I would, I would treat it as cautious, especially if something is the sister to the king cobra. Um, and, you know, again, it's just always better to be safe. There are several lineages and studies that show that sister species uh, venomous snakes, um, there's a lineage that can kill you and another one where the venom is really not much of a problem. So a question from Fritz Akain, um, is there a species of Philippine Cerberus and uh, Philippine endemic Hemibungaris, uh, which can be found in other par in parts of Mindanao? Uh, in parts of Mindanao, I believe, uh, and I know that there are some uh, others uh, here from Mindanao, uh, there are Philippine uh, Cerberus that are from Mindanao. In terms of Hemibungaris, I am not sure, and I'm not sure if there are, I haven't seen any with localities from Mindanao, but I have seen specimens of Cerberus that are listed as being from Mindanao. Okay. From Jesslian uh, Len uh, Plaza, uh, she's curious, what are your expectations uh, or what are, what do you hope to find should uh, you have the appropriate molecular samples to match with your hemibungaris morphological data? Well, in terms of expectations, I guess this boils down to what I find some really cool research questions. But what I would really like to see, is a weird way to phrase it, is, um, and what I expect to see, to be honest, is that hemibungaris gemmy annulus 
is its own species. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that Caligaster and McClungy are also um, distinct species. However, that CF McClungy is a contact zone between the two. Um, there would really need to be studies uh, or analyses of gene flow and directions of gene flow when it comes to studies like that to assess species boundaries because uh, we need to see if gene flow is unidirectional or is it bidirectional across that fault line. Uh, and there have been studies, uh, for example, you know, while we're talking about birds here in crows that have shown similar stories where you have these two species that are thought to be distinct. And then it turns out, as you look at these intermediate populations, you kind of have this gradation of genetic structure. So, um, you know, I think this is a case of secondary contact. Uh, and this kind of coincides with the ge geologic history of the Philippines as well, uh, but who knows. All right, thank you. So from Darwin Ganado, uh, his question is, what elevation range uh, is uh, Hemibungar's Caligaster most likely to be found? Uh, to be honest, I'm not too sure, but I believe it's going to be more uh, lower elevation. So if there's anybody in here that has found Hemibungar's higher elevation spots, uh, feel free to say and let me know. Um, and, you know, I really wish that I had found uh, Hemi Bungar uh, more Hemi Bungaris while I was in the Philippines. Um, but, you know, this is going to have to wait for further field expeditions. Yeah. So from Nix Velasquez, uh, the question is, knowing how challenging it is to get samples for many reasons, um, was wondering what is the minimum number of samples for morphological and molecular studies is? Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question again? I think, uh, um, this is the one about the non-lethal way to obtain samples. No, it's, uh, um, or... uh, Nix is just asking what is the minimum number of samples that you should collect, uh, for morphological and molecular studies, uh, okay. knowing that yeah. it is really cha challenging for you to get samples. Yeah, uh, so this is really a problem, especially when it comes to snake studies. Uh, it's commonly known that snake studies usually have smaller sample sizes when we're looking at studies with other groups that are examining the and test or testing the same hypotheses and asking the same evolutionary questions. Typically, I would like to have at least five to ten per population, and so a population is going could be subjective at times. Your population could be different islands if they're small. They could be the different uh, cardinal directions of islands. So let's say if we're talking about Mindanao, your populations might be based off of ecoregions. They might be based off of different sides of a mountain range. Uh, even if we're talking about Lake Buhi, when I was talking uh, to the mayor and the mayor's team, I really had to, and I also participated in a, in a PAMBI meeting, I had to kind of explain that for this study, what we would really want to do is look at populations of Cerberus microlepis. And while we might consider the lake to be one population, that would be getting five to 10 samples from north, south, and then east and west on that lake. So typically, whatever you're going to identify as your populations, I would say try to get at least five samples, but sometimes you have to work with, with what you've got. And you need to um, just take a little bit of caution interpreting your results. So for example, when I spoke about Cerberus today, I think I made this presentation four times. I'm like, should I even include that Sorsagon sample? Because that Sorsagon sample sometimes is out of the Philippines group and sometimes within it. But the most in-depth sampling and analysis I did on my computer showed it as outside of the Philippine group. So, you know, you need to present the data that you get and just be open-minded about multiple hypotheses and the need for future work. Right. So the follow-up question is, um, you mentioned uh, obtaining blood is a non-lethal way to obtain the samples and uh, was wondering if you could, uh, if you could point the audience to where or to, to point them to the direction where they can learn how to do this probably are there any like organizations or agencies that provide training or probably a lab uh do you know experts in the on, sense of the in the sense of the studies themselves well, probably on you have a training give them training yeah. on uh obtaining bloods blood samples uh from live uh, specimens yeah, when it comes to obtaining uh, blood samples or any type of sampling from any specimens, whether that is going to be 
um, doing non-lethal or lethal uh, methods. Mm -hmm. This is really going to be learned from you going into a lab and doing that research. So when it comes to this, you know, you can't just go out and, you know, decide to get some tissue or get some samples, yeah. even if it's non-lethal. You need very strict um, permits and guidelines on how you're going to do this, as well as approved protocols. So there are plenty of papers in uh, the published literature that you can see how people make the solutions for euthanasia, how they inject them, what are the best ways to inject them. There's a vast literature on this, as well as how to take non-lethal samples, such as scale clippings and, uh, uh, you know, blood samples. Can you get that from a YouTube university? Probably. <laughs> 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 so from Karen Ardes, uh, what um, software did you use for multivariate statistics? Uh, is it, uh, for, can you, can you ac access them for free? Yeah, yeah. So uh, all of those analyses, the principal coordinate analysis, as well as the LDA were performed in R uh, using code. So, uh, you know, the machine learning algorithm uh, for LDA was specifically performed using the correct package. Uh, and this also includes a variety of other packages. So uh, if you'd like, I am happy to send along those methods if you want to send me an email. Um, and I don't know if I should put my email in here or something or if you guys have it. Uh, or, um, you know, that paper will be published, I'd imagine, sometime later this year. All right. So from William Joshua Tan, um, is there any possible medical use uh, which can be found from the venom of, of homolopsids? So <laughs> I cannot confidently say yes, because this is not my expertise. But the venom that is found in Cerberus, and uh, there haven't been many studies on the venom of homolopsids, and uh, Dr. Brian Fry has mentioned that he does have some uh, uh, research in the works that do include homolopsids, so I'm super stoked for that to come out. Um, at some point, but there have been some studies that have shown that the venom of Cerberus includes a venom protein family that is not found in other lineages of snakes. Mm -hmm. So while I cannot confidently say yes, it does seem that homolopsids and venom studies on homolopsids do hold some promise. So a question from Aaron James Ortega, are there any particular genus or family of snakes that you would like to study here in the Philippines other than the ones that you are already doing or you have done for your research? All of them. <laughs> um, I, I would, re I would really, <laughs> yeah, catch them all. I would, uh, I would really like to actually, and I've, I've never studied these groups before, mm -hmm. but there's actually a lot of interesting questions when it comes to the cobras that are found in the Philippines, whether it comes to their relatedness, uh, their ability to spit venom, or uh, some of their dentition morphology. So uh, there's a lot of interesting evolutionary questions there that I would like to answer and investigate. Um, right now, homolopsids and hemibungars are kind of like a, uh, my two babies that I have really developed a love for. Uh, and, you know, one lineage that I'm actually really stoked to hear more about are these cyclochorids. And I think that we're going to see a lot of cool research come out of the Brown Lab uh, and from uh, Jeff uh, over at the University of Kansas. Okay. From Joaquim de Sena, uh, what other snake species uh, uh, mimics the color pattern of barred coral snakes? So um, in terms of the coral snakes, uh, there are, it really depends, but uh, when it comes to, I believe, and honestly, I would really have to go back and look because uh, sometimes even I get confused with some of the other genera as I really focus on just a few of the lineages. But I believe that there are some uh, calamaria, these reed snakes that have some intricate banding patterns. Uh, but I would honestly have to get back to you because there are a variety of snakes that do exhibit um, red, black, and white coloration. Uh, but off the top of my head, I really need to go back and check. Right. So uh, we have two more questions. Uh, second to the last uh, from Connie Casenas. Uh, based on your data gathering and analysis, did, did you also indicate the relative abundance of your voucher specimens uh, and the current conservation status assessed by both the IUC and Red List and the Philippines Red List Committee? 
<laughs> so unfortunately, uh, I have to answer that question with the same way that we know the conservation status of many snake lineages, and that's data deficient. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, I cannot make uh, any judgment calls in terms of abundance when it comes to uh, the lineages that we're studying, other than the fact that I can say that the one night that we did go out uh, when we were at, or the few nights that we went out when we were at like Buhi, we found a few of them. And, you know, some of them were kind of just like resting on top of each other in the streams. And I think we found, I think in one night, it was either five or six or seven or eight. Uh, so we found quite a few. And this is like, this was all within, I don't know, a couple hundred feet. Uh, so let alone how many we would have found if we checked all the other tributaries in the area. So I do know that when it comes to Cerberus, they are very densely populated uh, and you know people people have reported uh, seeing hundreds of them as they were just like walked along for 15 20 minutes and they could be really abundant as for Cerberus microlepis which again is this endangered species I can't say much because while it seems like they're densely populated in that one stream that I was at I would need to check out other areas and also I can't really make a judgment call without knowing what the species boundaries are between microlepis as well as uh, uh, Schneider eye um, you know and this kind of also goes into other populations as well such as Cerberus dunsoni which are those ones from Pulau. All right. So very quickly, so a uh, question from Nova May Culantes. Uh, what particular software did you use for phylogenetic analysis? For phylogenetic analysis, I use Maximum Likelihood, and specifically, I used RaxML for the software. All right. So this will be our last question uh, from Ike uh, Louis Garne Gavertas. Um, what makes the Hemibongaris unique uh, from the Calliope? in terms of their distribution as we all know that these two uh, are both elamids right. and uh, coral snakes. Mm -hmm. uh, so <clears throat> a few interesting things to know is that um, <clears throat> the Calliophis are not as related uh, to these Hemibangaris, which, which is why we call them false coral snakes. They're actually not coral snakes. Um, and, uh, and it's pretty hard to remember that even for my, myself, uh, sometimes they sometimes call them Philippine coral snakes, and then I have to correct myself. But it's a common name. Um, for Calliophis, they are all there are species of Calliophis that are distributed outside of the Philippines as well as within uh, the Philippines. And Hemibungaris is only found within the Philippines. And also, furthermore, uh, not just in terms of their distribution, but also there are these. Um, uh, long and short glanded species of Calliophis, where as Hemibungaris, we really don't know much about what their venom glands are like. And this is, uh, these are a lot smaller species. Uh, but just in terms of the distribution, Hemibungaris is only found in the Philippines and has not been reported from anywhere else outside. All right. So uh, thank you very much to all those uh, who participated in our open forum. Before we go to the closing program, let me just uh, post the evaluation link on the chat box. And uh, we want to, you know, on behalf of the Museum of Natural History here at UP Los Banos, uh, we would like to thank uh, Justin M. Uh, Bernstein for this uh, great talk. And we are hereby awarding the certificate of recognition. And it reads, uh, Certificate of Recognition is awarded to Justin M. Bernstein for serving as a resource person during the 2021 MNH Biodiversity Seminar entitled Serpent Sequences and Statistics Using DNA and Morphology to Study the Biodiversity and Evolution of Philippine Snakes. Held uh, today, 26th of May, 2021, from 10 a.m. to 11.30 uh, Philippine Standard Time via Zoom and in witness whereof the signature of our director, Dr. Marian P. De Leon, is hereby uh, affixed. Thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, make sure to visit our website. It's at uh, mnh.uplb.edu.ph or probably you could just drop us a line. Uh, email us at mnh.uplb at up.edu.ph. We are on Facebook, Twitter, um, YouTube and uh, Instagram, just look for the handle UPLB Museum and um, the recording will be uploaded uh, later at our uh, YouTube channel, youtube.com slash UPLB Museum. Please uh, do like us and follow us on Facebook and Twitter and check out our articles at 
uh, Wikipedia and Trip Advisor. So and with that, so in Filipino, maraming salamat sa inyong lahat uh, to all our uh, participants. Thank you once again for being with us and to our esteemed uh, guest speaker. Justin, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and uh, we wish you uh, more luck and more success on your uh, future research endeavors here in the Philippines. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it and it was a pleasure.